In the short documentary video from Minecraft Education, listeners, it is linked in the show notes. I would almost say, pause me right now, go over and watch this very moving video, then come back to the episode. We hear you talk specifically about the initial goal you had for launching a Minecraft club at your school, and that was really to be a space for kids to relax and have fun. A very important goal. Um, I, I say that not in jest. I say that I, I think it's a goal that we need to have now more than ever before. Today, as you look back at that club, um, you know, I'm wondering how that club has critical connections with equity, accessibility, and sustainability. Um, can you can you just sort of speak more about those connections for somebody who is listening and thinking? Minecraft can do all of that, huh? Could you uh, could you maybe clarify? Yeah, that's a great question. And I feel like a lot of my background on this comes from the fact that I also grew up in New York City, born and raised in Queens, and all my students are local to New York City as well. So we had this critical connection with, with each other. And my students are definitely, because I'm on the younger side, they definitely feel more connected to me than they would like their average teacher. So going into this, and I played Minecraft myself since like I was in high school, and it's been like 10 years since then. So I had a little bit of background on how to like connect with the student a little bit better in terms of video games in the classroom. And I definitely agree that this is like one of the big things that video games should make a push for going forward with accessibility and equity, but we can also push it in the direction of sustainability as well. And Minecraft was just perfect for that. It was never my original goal, but I'm so glad like my students and I stumbled upon this as we were working our way through what Minecraft Club was, what activities we wanted to do. And I found it so great, specifically the Minecraft education version, just because in New York City, it's available for free to all teachers, staff, and students as well with their DOE login information. So that was really good because like when I was growing up, Minecraft, the regular edition, that was the only thing available. That was like $20, $30. Not everybody could afford that. But the fact that you can get this education variant, which has a lot of the similar features to the regular Minecraft for free, and it can run on pretty much anything, uh, mobile devices, Chromebooks, iPads, computers, MacBooks, that made it much more powerful to me too. So we could all play together regardless of what device you have. And we are at my school, John Dewey High School, we're a Chromebook school. So it's great to know that I have like 36 devices in my room ready to go to play Minecraft whenever I need it. So that was showing me that this is like super accessible. Minecraft could be this great tool that we can use just because anybody can pick up and play it. And the fact that it's just a sandbox game and it's very core nature where there's not a specific goal unless you want there to be. And it really shows me like when I'm seeing students play in like a survival world when we started this like two or three years ago, that it was really cool that they all had different goals in mind when we played together. Some people wanted to speed run the game, get to the end, fight the boss, the ender dragon. Others wanted to build like a relaxing community for themselves and a home. And it just really was a great way of expressing themselves. And the fact that we were playing in like this survival world taught some like unintentional lessons on sustainability because there's limited resources. They had to think about how many trees we had to chop down for this and how to take care of livestock and grow crops and stuff like that. And then when we started getting into esports, and the New York City Department of Education has been making this huge push for esports, and they were really inspired by the work that my students have done. They wanted to attach the sustainability theme for it, and Minecraft was perfect for that. Just recently, my students won the Brooklyn Borough Championships for the Minecraft esports thing, and that was crazy. Like, and they built these amazing builds within 30 minutes. So they would have like 30 minutes of prep time, 30 minutes to build and then five minutes to present, to present those builds. And their builds were really great. And they tackled like themes about how to prevent coastal flooding, how to take existing infrastructure in New York City and have it use renewable and clean energy resources. So I think in a classroom generally, when you give a student these types of questions, if you're doing like a traditional like lecture and PowerPoint lesson, it might not hit them as hard. Uh, but if you put it into a video game and gamify that, give it a game-based learning platform, 
Minecraft was really great for that just because it was a tool that so many kids were familiar with already. They were already learning this, just they weren't aware of it. And then when you bring it in that way, it showed me that like, this is the connection. This is like the best game for this to connect it back into the classroom for not just sustainability, but also making things more equitable and accessible for all diverse learners. Well, and I I love in that video as well, you show how it's, you know, to a certain extent, empowering learners to teach teachers, right? And so just even the notion of the teacher who is not familiar with Minecraft or didn't grow up um, playing it, this is maybe an area of expertise where students can take the lead and they can be in the driver's seat. Um, I'm wondering if you want to talk a little bit about that sort of um, that experience of, of teachers getting to learn directly from students via Minecraft. Yeah, that's definitely been one of the most powerful things I've seen with this, like not just with me, but with other educators, not just in my school, but also within our district. I'll get more into that in a little bit. But starting from me, like when we started this Minecraft club, when I started this, I was not aware of all the new updates, the new mobs and all these different biomes in Minecraft. And my students had to walk me through it like, oh, Mr. Ahmed, here's what you can do in the nether now and stuff like that. And I was just like, wow, like this has changed a lot in like the past 10 years since I played it. And it put them in that role of being a teacher. And that's just so powerful. So then we had the idea of establishing a Minecraft student ambassador program at our school when we saw, I believe it was at the Atlantic public school system, Um, they had this great program out in Atlanta where they were doing something similar. And I wanted to bring that into my school as well. So we hosted professional development for the teachers and it was a huge amount of interest for it. Our room was packed with teachers and we had like a bunch of students around that were leading these PowerPoints as well as walking around to help teachers, not only like depending on how like skilled they were, they were teaching them the very basics of how to move around and use a mouse in Minecraft. And then if they were more knowledgeable, how to use it for like, let's say your physics class or your chemistry class, what kind of lesson would be great for that? That was really cool to see. And then the little documentary video that Microsoft made, funny enough, a parent saw that video, not a parent for a student at my school, but they were um, at a school in... Manhattan, I believe, on the Upper West Side. I had no connection to this parent. They just stumbled upon my video. They reached out to me and they're like, hey, I would love for you to bring this into my son's school. Would you be able to do that? And I was just like, wow, this is like going beyond my school now. And there's so many groups out there of educators and parents who want to see this incorporated into their students' lives. And that's just really cool to see that This interest, like, obviously it's Minecraft, it's going to appeal to kids, but now adults and as well as adult learners want to see this incorporated into schools. And knowing that there's that interest that wasn't there initially, but when they saw that it was possible and this can be done, that just made me feel like, oh my God, like my work is like actually inspirational. That was just really cool to see. Oh, I mean, Meshvik, yes, hands down, your work is inspirational. And I have to ask, because I know that you also have a YouTube channel, you know, I'm glad that you brought up the accessibility piece with Minecraft in that you can play it across devices. Um, But it's also something that, you know, if you head over to YouTube, there are a lot of folks kind of sharing tutorials, some of them, yes, by students, students your ages, and others, you know, that are that are educators saying, hey, did you know that you can also use it for this? So I feel like there's a lot of really great Minecraft, like almost unofficial Minecraft content out there to learn from. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it was students who kind of nudged you to start your YouTube channel to be sharing a little bit more. Is that is, is that correct? Is my research <laughs> off? Or uh, can you correct me and, and set me on the right path if um if that's misinformation? Yeah, you've definitely done your research correctly. Yeah, I remember this started during the remote learning year. Um, my Minecraft club president, she suggested like l- lightheartedly, like, oh, Mr. Ahmed, you should totally make a YouTube channel. And then I was just like, oh, okay, I'll consider that. And then she went and made like a change.org petition, got a bunch of students and teachers to sign it. And I was like, I kind of had to do this now. And that was when we saw the birth of this YouTube channel. And she even came up with the username, Mr. Ahmed Gaming. And that just kind of became like my handle from there. So that, or like my gamer tag, depending on where I am. And that's how a lot of people know me now. Like I hear kids in the halls be like, oh my God, it's Mr. Ahmed Gaming. <laughs> and it was just really cool. Cause like to see like, content creation now coming from a teacher, somebody who you see as like maybe a role model 
And like, I realized like this puts me in a good position of influence and power. So I wanted it to be a, like a positive videos and content for my students. So I would have Minecraft videos as well as like, videos for like games indie titles that they might not be familiar with because i think they're at this age where they're being exposed to a lot of different video games and i want them to be able to explore like all the different pathways of gaming like i wasn't too familiar with indie games until i was an adult and i hope that they can see them at a much sooner age to show them that it's not just like these big three titles that make a release every year that's not all there is to gaming there's so much more and i do also focus on like having like more on the like the wholesome quality content side because like i feel like too many games these days are like kind of formulaic or like and i don't really want to feature like any kind of violence on my channel but i want to show them like there's other ways to have funds with video games there's like like strategy games as well as like platformers and these titles you might not normally consider and whenever i see like a great lesson in minecraft education i would love to like feature a little demo of that on my channel to show not just my students now because this is like really branching out but I also want to show it to like other educators who might be interested, who might want to see a little playthrough. And thinking about this recently, I was like just thinking, I gave a talk at City College a few weeks back. And this um, professor during the Q&A, he teaches philosophy. He asked me this great question about which kind of video games would be best for students to learn about in a philosophy class. And that really got me thinking and like kind of inspired me to want to do more videos on topics like that where like we assess the educational value of games that might not initially be tooled for education like minecraft is such as like something like let's say the last of us like what can we explore with the storyline there it's a very cinematic game or something that's more choosing your own adventure like life is strange or the puzzle games like portal there these games have a lot of educational value they might not be originally tooled for use it use in the classroom but it would be great to see those be assessed and potentially be brought into the classroom regardless because the educational value to these games is still there. I'm really <laughs> glad you brought that up because part of our esports mini series is also talking to some folks who are looking at games through a really interesting lens. We have somebody who is talking about sort of the ethics and the law that we need to be thinking about within video games. Uh, Dr. Sarah Cower looks at video games through the lens of psychology, and she has a great YouTube channel where she also um, really looks at mental health representation in video games, which I had not thought about before. Uh, we have another professor coming on to talk about anthropology and what we can learn about anthropology through the lens of video games. So I think it's so great that you are having those conversations with students now. Uh, because, you know, my own learning through this, this mini series has been just how gigantic of an industry this is and how whatever your passion is as a student, if you are a gamer, you can kind of find a way to merge your interest in a gamer with a potential, uh, you know, career pathway, which I think is, is really exciting. And I, I think, you know, you've talked about the uses for games in the sciences, but I think humanities and ELA and really reading some of these games as a text, thinking about representation is also really, really powerful. So I'm just really glad that you brought that up. Yeah, when you bring up humanities, it actually reminded me, I, last year, a couple of English teachers at our school came by my classroom because they wanted support on using Minecraft, and their English class was learning about dystopian societies, and they wanted to do something with that. So I proposed that we do like a Minecraft build challenge with the class where they build a dystopian society within Minecraft. So it's definitely possible with all content areas, whether it's STEM, humanities, I definitely think incorporating them into these subjects as possible it's just a matter of finding the appropriate video game title as well as just figuring out what the specific task is for the student to do yeah and as you say you know just noticing what our peers are doing like i love that in that example it's literally looking across the hall and connecting with teachers that's kind of beautiful as well um, you mentioned that some of your students will kind of recognize you in the hall and you've got some street cred but it's been earned you've been inducted into the games awards future class of 2022 congratulations we're also going to link to their website in the show notes and that uniquely positions you to talk about the future of gaming and esports what is it that you would like to see in perhaps the very near future for student gamers? There's a lot that I want to see with student gamers in the future. So I've 
taught a game development class this past year with all the success I've had with Minecraft. My school is interested in seeing it go further. I would definitely like to see students more interested in like games, but not just playing them or like streaming and doing content creation. There's so much more that we could do with them. I've seen students hone their skills with graphic design. Like my current Minecraft club president, she makes like these amazing posters for our club that are like plastered all over our hallways, as well as for our social media. Like she makes these great designs and she was able to hone these skills because of her passion of gaming and Minecraft in school. So that's really cool to see. And I've had other students who are like interested in drawing and they enter like the games for changes student challenge and they might not be the best coders and programmers, but where their skills are are with drawing. So they enter like the characters design competition where they design a character for a game and just lay out like their lore and backstory. I've had another student who's super into gaming journalism and we attended like this virtual panel hosted by a couple of video game critics and they went over like the best tips and practices for game reviews. So it's really cool. And also because when I'm attending these with them, I also feel like a student as well because I'm learning so much and that's just really cool. Cause like I'm with them like on the side there, but not just as like a chaperone or a supervisor, I'm learning with them. And that makes them feel much more comfortable around me to ask any like questions or anything is because we're all learning this together. And that's just really cool to see like the game industry, like sparking interest in these students and also myself as well. So I definitely hope that like the game awards future class says it represents the bright, bold and inclusive future of gaming. I definitely hope that we keep making that push to make gaming more accessible and equitable for students, not just within New York City, but across the world. Yeah. And I think, you know, again, we I think in education, we talk about student voice, student agency. And I think this is another realm where we can invite students to show up to hold the industry accountable. Like, you know, what are you noticing with panels? Uh, What are you noticing with awards? What are you noticing with like you know, who can be a gamer or who is seen as a gamer and who is not and helping students also kind of like petition for that world that they hope to see. Um, you know, the, the the journalism piece is really interesting because about a year ago, we hosted Swamp Krishna on the podcast and she shared the story of how she got her own column in Wired magazine on gaming. And she essentially told us she was looking at their reporting on gaming and was trying to see like, what's the angle that they're not really talking about? And she had mentioned that she calls herself a gamer, but she's not really interested in, uh, you know, comp- competitive games. She's more interested in like strategic logic games, like, and it's almost a part of her wellness routine. And she's like, I don't see anybody reporting on that. So I'm going to, I'm going to pitch them and I'm going to see if they're interested in that kind of coverage. And, it blew my mind a little bit. And I just kind of think as an activity for students to see if you are interested in gaming, what about your experience is unique that you're not seeing explored in that world of, of gaming journalism. Um, I just, I, I loved her story that she sort of, you know, did her research, tried to see like, where is my unique angle? And now as a column in wired magazine, like what a dream for a gamer. Yeah, that's like a great story right there. And I've been seeing that a lot. Like if I open up TikTok right now, I'm pretty sure my For You page is going to show me videos of video games from like the wholesome, cozy gaming genre. And it's great to see like there's this huge push for it now in these past several years. I didn't really have that growing as a kid. So it kind of made it seem like games were only like this brown, grayscale shooting art style. And like, it's great to see that games aren't like that anymore, especially for kids. Like, so a kid will have definitely some type of game out there that's of their interest. There's so many different genres and aesthetics to it now. And a lot of my students in my Minecraft club, they are definitely interested in these titles as well. I think that's what drew them into Minecraft more than any other game, just because of the open nature of it and whether they wanted to lean more into the competitive aspect or more the collaborative aspect, Minecraft was available for whichever one they wanted to do, which is what I really like about the whole esports with Minecraft that we've been doing. A lot of people, when they think about esports, they think of just like player versus player combat because that's what a lot of it is. But when we do our Minecraft esports, it's largely about building competitions. They get a prompt. They have to work together as a team to make the best build. I always forget which one I call it. I either call it it was collaborative 
competition or competitive collaboration, which everyone mm-hmm. sounds better, you know, but that is like what I see this as like, yeah, it's still competitive, but they're still learning how to work together and hone like their problem solving skills as a team. And, uh, you know, I just I think that is so great because, of course, problem solving, critical thinking, collaboration, creativity, we know these are essential skill sets. And I think we've got to look at our schools and say, where are all of the different opportunities for students to tap into those skills. Um, you know, when I was having a conversation with my parents about this mini series on esports, neither one of my parents had heard of it. They didn't really understand what it was. And I think they were a little bit dismissive of it. And I was saying, look, like when I was growing up, I was an athlete. So I had access to working together, being part of a small community, being a part of a team. But a few of my friends who weren't interested in music, weren't interested in athletics, like they didn't really have any other opportunities for that team experience where they were coming together, learning what I think is even an essential skill of like, how do you cope with a failure when it's a shared experience? Um, And I I think these things are really important. And I'm just so happy to see this new ish avenue where students can come together and experience that because I I just think we need multiple opportunities, um, I think, to work on these skills. It can't just be, well, I'm a member of the basketball team, so therefore I will learn all of this just on the court. I just don't think life works that way. Yeah, that's a good point. I definitely agree with those things that you just mentioned about specifically with just like understanding what esports is. A lot of my students and myself included growing up, like we weren't like the best at sports, but like they, we still wanted that competitive aspect explored and esports provided a great accessible avenue for something like that. And it was really cool to see. And like when you're talking about parents, it just reminded me of like my own parents, like my parents, um, they immigrated here in the nineties and like, they might not fully understand what I'm doing with this Minecraft stuff. And like, they largely see my job as what it originally was just, I teach chemistry classes. So they see me as a science teacher in high school. And when that documentary released last year, like that actually was the way I actually told my own mom what I've been doing besides teaching chemistry, because I think she needed a visual for it. There's no way I could explain to her what Minecraft actually is. She would probably just think I'm just playing video games and that's it. But that video was so powerful to show to my own mom, just because she can see like her son is like doing something that she has never seen before. And she finally understands like why maybe I've been like working so hard or staying late at school and stuff like that. So I imagine that other parents, like my students' parents are having the similar effect. Like, they're seeing this happen. And I've seen like a lot of parents have told me like, wow, like my kid is like super into this stuff. And I'm just like, yeah, like we're doing amazing work with this. And I hope they continue to do stuff like this in the future. Uh, That is a beautiful story. And I think for folks that maybe don't have the benefit of Microsoft doing the documentary, I think what you said about the power of visual is really true. So I feel like even taking kind of a, a very average, not professional video that shows what's going on can be really powerful because I do think my sense is, unfortunately, there is still like an awareness and education piece so that folks can understand what this is. And, and you know, the documentary does such a great joy, job of capturing that joy. So folks, again, like maybe it's the fifth time I've said it in this episode, go watch it um, and and share it. Um, adding on further to your credentials, again, students, you know, yelling out your name in the hallway, you were also featured on a panel that's entitled My- Minecraft as a Springboard for Esports Success. And that's from Focus on EDU. It's a great panel. The link is over there in the show notes. And as I was watching it, it reminded me of the newsletter you share. That link is also going to be in the show notes. That uh, has a really great run through of the many ways your Minecraft club has built community, you know, inviting those teachers in as we were talking about. And you describe Minecraft to be a tool where players can, quote, learn about themselves. Can you say more about Minecraft as that arena for identity work and exploration? Yeah, um, that's really um, an amazing tool where Minecraft comes in handy. And like I said, like I didn't anticipate something like this. It was something my students and I stumbled along the way. 
And I feel like representation is always critical, not just in video games, but in media as a whole. And growing up, I never really had like video game characters that really looked like me. So whenever there was a game that lets you customize a character naturally, and I didn't realize I was doing this until like my brother points out one day, every video game character I always made, they always kind of looked like me. They would have like black hair, a beard, maybe glasses. And I realized that I was doing this just because I never really had this experience as a child. And I remember when I first played Minecraft, it was a character, Steve, who had like a brown skin complexion and i was just like wow like that's new like i've never seen something like this before and like nowadays everyone can customize their minecraft skin and characters to whatever they feel is most comfortable with and i feel like that form of identity and expression just goes beyond just like simple skins for your character minecraft provides different avenues and different ways of expressing themselves like i said it's a sandbox tool the way you express yourself, you might not realize it at first, but like the activities that you partake in, nobody in within the game is telling you to do a certain thing. You're doing it out of your own volition. And that can help you really learn a lot about yourself. Like whether you're the type to, let's say if things get really difficult and you want to shut down the game and not play it for like several months until you get that urge to play again, it really tells you a lot about your habits, not just with playing video games, but just habits in general. And I find that's a great way that students can learn about themselves. And I've seen plenty of times in the classroom, but not just with students, but with adults when they're learning how to play Minecraft, where they might get a little bit frustrated when like something they want to do isn't working. Like, for example, a student's like trying to code something in Minecraft or a teacher's learning how to place down a block in Minecraft. And when they get frustrated, that the first time I saw that, that was really interesting because I remember my assistant principal, Nancy Woods, she made this interesting remark that still stuck with me that frustration isn't necessarily bad it shows that they care and they're willing to learn and keep learning because that's why they're frustrated if they really didn't care they wouldn't get frustrated in the first place and that tells you a lot about yourself when like you're feeling like these different emotions when you're playing a game and i think that's really powerful especially with games compared to something like books televisions and movies there's that interactive component so you feel a bit more agency and like it feels a bit more like emphasizing on like your specific choices and that really shows that like you can learn about yourself through that because you're inputting the choices into this and that makes it much more powerful and i found that with minecraft it can definitely help with that just because you can explore it however you want and i've definitely seen Minecraft and I know I know they've done like research with this that Minecraft is super popular with the neurodivergent community and I've seen that with my students I have a lot of students with disabilities and that you found Minecraft to be a great tool of expression for them and it's also been really popular with students to express with other like marginalized groups I've seen a lot of my Minecraft students actually the our leadership team is actually 100% consistent of gender marginalized groups, which is really interesting because it didn't like, we didn't like force that to happen. It just happened naturally. Like these kids gravitated towards it. And I always like wondered why that is. And they found it to be just a great tool for like expressing their identity. Oh, that's really fascinating. And you're reminding me, I can't remember how many years back this is. Listeners, forgive me for this. I will Google this as soon as we, we hang up this call. But I remember when Sims decided you know, they also were going to make sure that their avatars could represent gender diversity. Uh, you know, again, that uh, they were going to, I think, even look at having like same sex weddings in Sims and the stir that that caused and sort of the, uh, you know, both the, the support and the conversation. Right. And it was amazing because it was sort of like on one hand, what this is just a video game. But on the other hand, it was like, no, this is looking at representation in a very authentic way. And millions of people play Sims. Um, and it was really interesting to see how, you know, online sparks in, you know, quote, IRL in real life conversations. So, uh, you know, I, again, thank you for pointing that out. I'm going to look into that research, too, about Minecraft and neurodiverse learners. That's really fascinating. All of the links that we have talked about are going to be over there in the show notes. I really appreciate, again, you've got this great Minecraft Club link tree where folks can go and learn more. And I have no doubt that we're going to have some listeners who may also want to connect with you to hear more. Um, if you support other districts, you know, again, I love that story about how somebody from outside of your school said, hey, come help us. 
somebody else from far and away wants to reach out and see if they can bring you in to support their school or their district, what is the best way to contact you? Yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can contact me. Um, I actually, because of all this Minecraft stuff, it's actually how I got more involved in social media. Before that, I was just a lurker, but I realized I had to showcase all my students' amazing work. You can find me at Twitter at Mr. Ahmed Gaming. Our Instagram handle for our Minecraft club is at JDHS Minecraft Club. If you ever need to reach me via email, mahmed29 at schools.nyc.gov. Feel free to reach out. I'm happy to help, and so are my I students. I love that. Again, those links will be there in the show notes. Final question. I love that you were talking about games that are sort of just about joy, that are, I think, your words, maybe not mine, touchy-feely. Could you leave listeners with a recommendation of one of those feel-good games that um, that you are enjoying or that you would recommend maybe folks check out over summer? Oh, man, this is my favorite question. I love recommending video games to people. Uh, there's so many. Uh, the one that really stands out to me for like a feel good game. It's I want to say games in quotes because it's not really a game, but it released a few years back. It's called Kind Words. And this game has this really fascinating concept where let's say you you need to vent about something or you're stressed out. You can write out this letter and send it out there and an anonymous stranger will reply back with some words of inspiration. And these are real people replying back and you can do the same and try to help people with their problems and provide like the game is titled kind words for them. And what really impressed me about it was just that the community was so wholesome and uplifting. There's no like internet trolls or anybody trying to cyber bully. They do extensive moderation. And there's, even without the moderation, like people are naturally driven to be kind just because like there's had this cozy aesthetic of like you're in this room writing letters, lo-fi music is playing in the background. That was just like one of my favorite titles. And another one that I was actually talking about this one earlier with a colleague, there's this game, another indie title called Say No More. And this one was really fun. It's like a two, three hour experience. So it's pretty short, but it packed a lot of punch in that short time where the whole concept of it is you're this worker, like an intern at this corporation. And you're always like saying yes to all these tasks and it become overbearing. And then one day you suddenly learn how to say no. And that's all you can say. And you're just saying that as you make your way up the corporate ladder, saying no to every single supervisor. And it has this great lesson about just like, workers being exploited and how they should unionize as well as just like taking care of yourself and learning when to say no that game is probably like one of my favorite indie games and it really struck a chord with me just because i'm also the type to be like a people pleaser and always say yes so like it really helped me as the title is stated say I no more i love that and i know a number of educators who are focusing on some lessons around boundaries so i'm going to check that out and refer them to that game because that seems like a really interesting way to dig into that concept of boundaries um, thank you so much for those recommendations. I will link to those in the show notes. You've given us so much to follow up on. We really appreciate your time and we look forward to seeing um, the rest of your journey as it unfolds. I'm sure that uh, the work that you are doing, we're kind of just at the beginning of the game, so to speak. <laughs> thank you all so much. 